Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Evening, everybody. Um, tonight, I would like to offer some reflections on a topic that uh, has been coming up again and again with people I've been um, talking with and having Dhamma conversations with. And it's an attempt to explain something that is very important in meditation practice, is very important in insight practice, and yet is not a particularly core teaching of Buddhism. Um, it shows up, as far as I know, in only one place in the suttas, um, though it is, a very, it is a very important and famous place. And I think um, when one understands its scope, then they understand how to use this particular concept, this idea, um, to encourage themselves onward in the development of samadhi or concentration and the development of insight into phenomena. So this concept is that of the citta sankara. And if that doesn't sound like a common term, then it's not. But where it shows up is in the Buddha's teaching on Anapanasati. And Anapanasati is a core teaching. And in fact, Though some people complain that the Buddha didn't teach much in the way of like meditation techniques, like do this or count or note or all of the things that meditation teachers are commonly uh, instructing in these days, the Buddha did actually give a fully fleshed out meditation technique called mindfulness of breathing. The thing is it doesn't, it doesn't look as specific or as mundane as most meditation teachings. It doesn't tell you to note things or to scan through the body. Uh, it describes uh, applying mindfulness, applying mindfulness to something very natural that is in and out breathing. And that's what Anapanasati means. Mindfulness of in and out breathing or mindfulness with in and out breathing. And this teaching doesn't show up in just one place. There is a sutta uh, in the middle length discourses, 118, called Anapanasati Sutta. Uh, but there are also a bunch of other places where the Buddha um, gives these 16 steps of mindfulness of breathing meditation. And this is where we find an allusion to the Chitta Sankara. And the thing about Anapanasati is even though you could see it as a step-by-step -step meditation technique, and even though most meditators read it all in one sitting and then try to apply all 16 steps, uh, it is something that can be continually unpacked for the entirety of your life. The reason the Buddha only, in terms of like a systematic step-by-step -step meditation technique, only gave really just this one is because that's the one that he used. It's the one he used before he was enlightened. It's the one he used to get enlightened. And it's the one he used after he was enlightened. So it worked for him. And he described it very fully. And he described it also in a way that was not overly specific um, in terms of like ideas like counting or ideas of looking for particular things. He described it in more general terms of what you're going to be seeing in terms of signposts or landmarks as your samadhi deepens and what things you should focus on. So um, the part of the Anapanasati Sutta that we're gonna be talking about tonight is steps five through eight. This, this comes a bit after the introductory part, um, the first four steps, which deal with the body, mindfulness of breathing as it occurs in the body. But to understand steps five through eight, we'd have to re review just a tiny bit um, 
what this idea of mindfulness of breathing in the body is referring to. It's referring, um, the Buddha uses a term called Kaya Sankara. And when we understand that, then we'll start to understand what the Chitta Sankara might be. Um, the Kaya Sankara is, uh, the Buddha said, a, a certain body among bodies. And as you know, breathing is a kind of body. And what does that mean? He's not referring specifically to some idea like we have some internal energetic body uh, made up of prana. You know, that is one mental concept that people have used to try to describe something that they're seeing. Uh, but that's, that's not necessarily what the body, uh, Buddha is talking about. When the Buddha talks about Kaya Sankara, he's pointing to um, really three things, but one thing in particular. The, the three things he's pointing at, we have a physical body. It's right here. It's made of stuff, yeah? This physical body has bones, it has flesh, it has blood. And it's sweat, fat, and tears, all of these things. A physical body is breathing. This is discernible. Air goes in, air goes out. But there's also a mental image of the body. And this is something quite interesting because when we close our eyes, um, you, and you can try this, close your eyes and put your finger on your nose. Did you get it in the first try? I consider myself quite lucky. I, I didn't get exactly on the tip of my nose, but this is the reality. Our image of our own body is different from the physical reality of the body. And how could it be otherwise? We have an idea that we're breathing, right? But does that match the anatomic reality? Maybe we feel pressure of things moving here or there. We feel like a sack that's expanding and then contracting. But then if we were to watch a video of ourselves, we would not see a sack expanding and contracting. We'd see a bunch of tiny sacks expanding and contracting within a confined space. It just doesn't look anything like what we think it is. So the Kaya Sankara is neither of those two things. The Kaya Sankara or the body formation is the meeting point of the two. The Buddhist idea of a Sankara, a Sankara is something which tries to form different objects into one thing. Like I have five fingers, um, but a Sankara would be to call this a hand. Uh, each finger is its own thing. And yet they operate as a unit. And the Sankara is the idea which allows us to think in terms of a hand, even though there are so many things in a hand. There's, there's fingers, there's nails, there's hairs, there's skin, there's muscle, there's bone. And yet all we have to think is hand and we can move it through space and get it to do things. So Sankaras are our idea to simplify things or to package things together. And this is what the, the Buddha has us looking at when we first start to meditate. He's having us start to be mindful of the process of in and out breathing, because this is a particular meeting point of our mental idea of the body and the physical reality of our body. The body is physically breathing. That is not an illusion. Uh, but it's not doing it in the way that we think. But as our mind starts to relax and pay attention to this experience, it will start to drop its various concepts and delusions around breathing and just allow the process to be what it is. We start to become more aware of the reality of our body. Now, the fourth step of mindfulness of breathing is to allow this body formation, this idea of body that links our mental idea of body and our physical reality of body together, we drop it because at a certain point, there won't be a great deal of difference between the two. We'll actually be quite content with the anatomic reality of the body and our mind will be satisfied with it. It will actually kind of just like you know, feeling reality, like breath 
you know, moving past the tip of the nose or the, the chest expanding and contracting. It won't try to mess with or reconceptualize this experience. And part of the reason why um, there's not a whole lot in terms of teachings on the Chitta Sankara uh, as a, as a follow-on concept is because the vast majority of meditators are gonna stay in those first four steps. Uh, they're gonna do their insight practices there. They're going to look at that, that reality of the Sankara, that curious reality that we have to, we feel like we have to bring these two realities together. We, we can't have them be um, different. All right. How did they get different in the first place? Like, why does our mind have a different idea of the body than the actual reality of it? Well, because we're trying to put a self there. We're trying to create an us. But the anatomic reality is there's, there's no us. There's just a mess of anatomical parts. So once the mind stops trying to put an us in the physical reality, um, then the mind can be one thing and the body can be another thing. And it's not threatening at all. Uh, we start to see the mental processes and the body, uh, mindfulness begins to envelop it. Now, this is where things get really interesting in our modern culture. Uh, because at the point where the, the Kaya Sankara is tranquilized, it falls away, it disappears, it's no longer needed. Pleasure starts to arise in the mind. And this pleasure sends us, usually the first time it happens, spinning in all sorts of directions. And there's a particular reason for this. And that is because ultimately the pursuit of pleasure is why we are alive. It gives us a, a driving force. It gives us momentum. In the first four steps of Anapanasati, in the vast majority of our waking conscious life, we'll be operating at a very basic level of seeking pleasure. We'll be seeking the pleasure of the body being satisfied. We'll be seeking the pleasure of sensual experience. And this doesn't involve mental pleasure so much. And we, we check in on the body, we see that the body is happy, it ate something good, it's sleeping in a comfortable place, it's warm when it's cold or it's cold when it's hot, and we're happy. And we tell ourselves that that's good enough. And we dwell at a very basic level of pleasure, sensual pleasure. And this is fraught with all kinds of, of lust and repulsion. Uh, it's a very uh, weak state of concentration. But most people can do a, a lot of insight there, just looking at how they are in the world. When we practice meditation long enough, though, and we start to tweak our lifestyle in a way that brings peace in, in a regular and consistent manner, uh, this is not something like we just sit down on a cushion and if we do a particular thing with our mind, suddenly we get ecstatic pleasure. This is something like we start to really develop the process of meditation until, until it becomes second nature. And we develop our lifestyle so that the body can relax in an extremely uh, profound way. The body can relax in such a profound way that we mentally don't even feel like we need to attend to it anymore. We feel like it's good. And that sets our mind free. So um, pity and sukha are a level of mental pleasure that most people have no concept of. They maybe are experiencing it to, to some tiny degree all the time, but be, our culture doesn't really relate to it because our culture mostly is thinking about sensual pleasure, pleasure that comes from an external object or situation. Most of our culture is not dealing with mental pleasure that doesn't come from something, um, but we, we're aware that it exists. We're aware that some people are just happy with no reason. We're aware that some people are just content with no apparent reason. And we maybe want that, but we don't know what it's like. It's just, it's just hypothetical. 
until we start to meditate and still we, until we start to really practice and simplify our lives and devote some time and energy to it. And then we'll start to have this experience. But if we haven't had this experience, then how would you describe it? Um, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, that's the conundrum. And that's why there, there isn't a whole lot of diversity to the teachings about piti and sukha, these two forms of mental pleasure in the suttas. Because if you put too much out there about it, people are going to develop the wrong ideas. That's how we're wired. We're wired to get things out there. So if you plop something in front of somebody, like the idea of mental rapture, they're going to try to find it externally. You can, you can put this idea of piti sukha there nestled in a meditation teaching and just wait. When people are experiencing some sort of pleasure that's not coming from an apparent source, then they'll start to, they'll, they'll look and they'll start to understand what that label is. But um, because, Piti and sukha always exist in the mind. Uh, it is possible to try to describe what they are and where they come from. The, the commentaries to the Pali Canon tries to use this particular simile of a person moving through a desert. And this person is very hot, so this person is sweating, it's very dry, and there's no water. But at some point, they come upon a well. And if you can imagine, if you very thirsty, it's a very hot day, and suddenly you peer over the edge of a well, and just there, just barely, you know, just a few feet down is cool, clean, crisp, clear water. So if you can imagine that experience of looking down and seeing the water uh, that is the solution to all of your thirst, right there within reach, um, that first experience of exuberance at your problems having been solved uh, would be the experience of piti. Uh, it's rapture, it's delight. It's a sort of bouncy, giddy feeling that says, okay, great, I'm gonna be all right. Uh, it is a relief from problems, a relief of suffering. Now, you, you, there's a, there's a dipper by the well and you stick it in and you scoop up some water and you drink one long deep uh, drink of water. The experience of bliss and satisfaction and deep relief that you feel within your body at having now drank that water is what the Buddha calls sukha. So this is the commentary's um, description of piti and sukha. And step five of anapanasati or mindfulness of breathing is to experience piti with the breath. Step six is to experience sukha with the breath. Now I was trying to think of, a, of a, another example which might work and um, I came up with something really quite similar. So imagine you've been in a plane crash and you're stuck on a, a desert island and you're there for a while and you're worried about what you're gonna do, where you're gonna get food. Maybe there's just one palm tree, um, you know, there's, there's nothing. But then off in the distance, you see a helicopter. Now the experience you have of delight at seeing the helicopter, that would be piti. Your problems are not solved. You're still got work to do. Um, the helicopter's not here. You're not safe. You're not on your way home, but you can see the answer in the distance. But once that helicopter lands and you get in and the pilot says, okay, let's get you home. And the helicopter starts to lift off and you don't have to move a single muscle from that point on and your problems are are all, all gone. That's the experience of sukha. And that's how I think of these qualities. So notice in both example, we're using a reference of the body. Like you're gonna, you're gonna experience this and you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna think in terms of the body. Now, the reason that piti and sukha are arising as steps five and six 
not much earlier, even though we can always perceive this flavor of relief and deep satisfaction in the mind at some time. If we, if we think of um, yeah, having, a, having a good meal when we're hungry, or we think of sinking into a nice soft bed when we're extremely tired, we might be able to, to bring up a bit of that sense of relief. Nevertheless, it's ephemeral. It doesn't quite have the same impact as what we're talking about. If it were a life and death situation, you would feel this on a, on a very deep cellular level. And if the idea of the Kaya Sankara is still there, then our experience of Pitti and Sukha, we're gonna to try to find it in the body. We're going to imagine we're gonna imagine pity as in our hairs as they tingle and we get goosebumps. Or we're gonna imagine sukha as um, our, our uh, capillaries and blood vessels opening up and flooding our body with uh, life-giving oxygen. We're gonna think all of these things. But if we've already tranquilized the bodily sankara, we might notice that pity and sukha have nothing to do with the body. They are mental experiences. Pity and sukha occur from relief, the relief of suffering. And so the most profound relief that can be the springboard to pity and sukha is the relief of putting the body down, of relinquishing the kaya sankara itself. That's a form of relief, which is so profound, it springboards us into um, rapture and bliss that are coming from no particular thing. They're coming from the absence of something, the absence of the, the, the dissatisfaction, the, the pain and the weight of trying to make the mental image of the body fit the physical reality of the body. When we let go of that, we have freed up a ton of energy. Now, something interesting is going to begin to be apparent once we have any experience of pity and sukha. And I say this with some, you know, um, you know, after some thought and with some hesitation, because when people find out about pity and sukha, that's all they want. They want to get pity and sukha. But it's a very interesting phenomena that when people actually do through hard work and devotion to their meditation practice, experience pity and sukha, you know what the first thing they do is? They start thinking about jhana. <laughs> they've heard about jhana, they've heard about this wonderful state of ecstatic bliss where their mind is powerful and can, can do whatever they want it to. And they know that people who have jhana are, are you know, are, are spiritual powerhouses. And so as soon as people experience pity and sukha, they start thinking, I can conquer the world. I'm going to go, I'm, this, is, this is it. This is a sign that I'm doing it as a meditator. I'm making it. I'm hitting the big leagues. And now jhana is just, just around the corner. Now, if you've never heard of jhana, that's great. That's great. Because I'm not going to be talking about jhana. <laughs> because in, in my experience, um, if we get to pity and sukha, and our, our first experience is to try to get something else, we have missed the profundity of this experience. We have missed the potential for insight. And we've missed the potential to make a real and lasting change in our life. Uh, because uh, pity and sukha and the chitta sankara itself are a reflection of our relationship to, to pleasure, to happiness. And if our experience of happiness is, is we immediately, we want to get something else, well, then we've got a very low level of contentment and satisfaction. Um, and probably this is something that needs to be worked on. Uh, so, so I've seen this in myself and I've seen it in a lot of people, like this experience of, of, of mental rapture and bliss is seen as a sign of success. And that success becomes an attractive object and you want more success. And so you start to pursue the success and you miss the reality that you have the thing that you've been trying to get 
your entire sensual lifetime, your entire lifetime as a human being satisfying your base human urges has been to try to get the experience of bitti and sukha. But you've only, you know, if you eat a good meal, you only get the tiniest bit of pity and sukha. It's not really solving your problems. You know, if you, you're hungry and you eat some food, you'll get some relief. There'll be some pity and sukha, some tiny bit. But at the same time, you're also filling your belly. You're creating unpleasant feelings at the same time. And it all kind of balances itself out. But when we practice meditation, when we practice relinquishment and contentment, and mindfulness, then we get a form of pleasure that is, is, is not from balancing things out, it's from letting things go. It's way, more, it's way more stable. And isn't that what we really want? Isn't that what we're really looking for? A stable form of happiness. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying it's, it's permanently stable, but it's much more stable than the momentary happiness we get from a sensual object. So, why, is it, why does it get so complicated? Well, the answer is the citta sankara. The, the answer is we have this uh, mental construction around pleasure. And if we just see piti and sukha as just a step on the way to deeper samadhi, then we're not appreciating the fact that most of our choices are informed by this citta sankara. Most of our relationships to ourself, to happiness, to pleasure, to goal seeking is this mass we call the citta sankara. It's linking our mental experience um, on, in a completely disembodied way, our mental experience of just the application of the mind itself to the reality of satisfaction that we get from Vedana. Vedana is a, a basic component of the mind. It's the experience of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Our mind is using this to decide whether an object is good or not, whether it should be pursued or not, how it relates to other things. We have an experience and we decide that's pleasant. We have an experience, we decide that's unpleasant. We have an experience and we decide that that's neutral. Now it's very interesting that even that, that it's almost, it's a lot like our physical reality. Once we get to know Vedana, once we get to know this valence of the mind, be it pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, we start to see that it doesn't really matter. We can have the experience of piti and sukha and one pointedness and concentration and happiness even if we're experiencing something unpleasant, even if we're experiencing something neutral, uh, all the more if we're experiencing something pleasant. So our anatomical reality in terms of emotions and feeling is different from our mental experience. Our mental experience is we're just seeing an object. You're just seeing an object. There's something beyond the perception and the feeling of that object. There's just the experience itself. So the citta sankara is our attempt to match these things together. We've got the object and we've got the way we feel about the object. And we're trying to get those to match, but they don't always. Sometimes it's a really repulsive object, but we're really happy about it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, meet a five-year-old, go hang out with a five-year-old. They can smear food all over their face and laugh with glee. How is that? It's, it's repulsive but they know it's repulsive. They're not threatened by the fact that it's repulsive. And so they're happy. They're happy with that experience. And they could be like, huh, why do we unlearn that? Nevertheless, we do. And we do to be goal-seeking human beings to try to get success. We develop this package of ideas around pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. And this package of ideas is just, is just a minefield. And once our meditation starts to develop and we start to come into this, this more subtle reality of our deeper motivations, well, we're walking out into that minefield. We have an experience of say rapture and suddenly all of our thoughts around rapture start popping up. 
Like, um, I'm king of the world. I can do anything. I'm invincible. This feels so great. I feel so healthy. I wanna go for a run. <laughs> I bet I could, I could box with Rocky and win. You know, it's like all of these ridiculous thoughts stop, start popping into our head. Why? Because that's our relationship with PT. Whenever we um, have the experience of seeing the solution to our problems, we feel that exuberant joy. And we've built up a lot of associations and ideas about what this means. Um, usually, and it's, it, in the beginning, it's not like that. In the beginning, we're just going through these, these experiences, but we build the chitta sankara because we don't necessarily trust ourselves along the way. And we've got greed, hatred, and delusion. So we start trying to package these ideas that when we experience exuberance, it means we're going, we're winning. It means we're succeeding. It means we're getting something. Uh, if we look deeply, that's not really what's going on. We have the exuberance and then sometimes we're getting something, sometimes we don't. Once we've, 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 let the, the physical reality subside, then we're starting to see the exuberance is there independent of our physical reality, independent of our conditions. Now I can say this, the only time you could experience that and really understand it and see it for yourself is in deep meditation, is when you've practiced a meditation technique enough that whether you're experiencing something painful, pleasant, or neutral, you're okay with it. All of the associations about what it means in the physical terms have subsided and you're just feeling that relief. The relief of not having to do anything about this feeling. And then, you know, then what happens? You start to, you start to feel some exuberance. Now for anybody who has only meditated a bit, probably all they're experiencing is pain. <laughs> pain in the knees, pain in the mind, um, the mind spinning round and round. So it's a kind of like distant concept. And if that's your reality, then you just set this aside for right now. Um, but this is something that the Buddha encouraged us to explore. The seventh step of Anapanasati is to experience the Chitta Sankara. So whereas most meditation teachers, as soon as you start to experience pitti and sukha, will say, great, you're on the way to jhana. These are jhana factors. They're factors of deep meditation, of deep samadhi. And you can use these. You want to build these and build these and build these and build these until they cause you to drop all of your mental constructions all at once because you don't need them because you're already happy. And so they try to teach you to, to take these experiences of Pitti and Sukha and just zip right for, for jhana, you know, to just fill the mind with happiness so that it becomes one pointed, so that it doesn't need anything external. But that's not what the Buddha taught. The Buddha taught, you know, it taught a step seven, which is to experience the Chitta Sankara, to really get to know it, to watch for these associations we have. So we experience a bit of, a bit of uh, sukha maybe, a bit of bliss and settling. And what do we do physically? Ah. But why do we do that? If the sukha is not in the body, why does the body react? This is what it is to explore and try to understand the chitta sankara. Um, because this is actually a subtle defect in our development of bhitti and sukha. Um, this linking, and that's what sankaras are, they're an attempt to link um, an experience of bliss with our physical reality. If we think that the, the bliss is coming from bodily satisfaction, then we start to, we start to get all goofy. And it's, it's not the worst thing. It actually, it's not, it's not unwholesome. You know, if we were experiencing really coarse, unwholesome states, we wouldn't have pity and sukha. We might have a pleasant vedana. Uh, there, even anger can sometimes have pleasant vedana. 
um, but it wouldn't be mental rapture and bliss. These are only things that come from wholesome mind states. Um, so we could, we could get all goofy when we start to experience these. And most meditators do, and it's, it's actually not a problem. I know of one, you know, very famous, you know, um, you know, enlightened teacher who has got the worst bodily posture in the world. And even to the point that people are like questioning, like, he's, he's enlightened, but he's, he's just like all over the place. He's just, just wandering around and, and people will ask, you know, other people who have like psychic powers, like, is he falling asleep? And, you know, the, the person with psychic powers would be like, I don't know, I'll check. Oh my goodness. No, that's the brightest mind I've ever seen. Um, because it really, the body also doesn't matter. And that's the thing. If we start to sink or we start to relax or we become loose, that's also quite natural, a quite harmless response to Bitti and Sukha. Uh, our physical reality can change. But what's important is that we start to pull apart these connections which say has to, or this means that because that's the danger of sankharas. It's not accurate. Uh, our, what we're going for as we begin to analyze and begin to understand the chitta sankhara is we're understanding our emotions, we're understanding our heart. And it's something I've noticed in meditators that once, um, before they experience, you know, actually pity and sukha in meditation, um, they have a lot of opinions about it and about jhana and they'll go on the message boards and they'll light people up, you know, about their particular take and their particular explanation of jhana. But once they actually experience it, most meditators become a little different. They become more subdued. They become more, a little, it seems like withdrawn, um, but also a little bit more peaceful. You know, it, it's like, Whereas before you, you, could, you could press their buttons, suddenly you go to press their buttons and you're not hitting anything. It's like the person is pulled back from the sensual world a little bit. And that's the reality when we start to experience pitti and sukha, we realize that there are deeper levels of the mind and that all of our surface decisions are motivated by something underneath by our pursuit of happiness at a deeper level. Once we have that happiness at a deeper level, we start to not care about the surface things. We start to not care about the food, about the bubble baths, about the travel to exotic countries. But it is, a, it is like, well, why else are we a human being but to experience interesting things, right? Well, a meditator would say, well, no, you know, I, I'm, I'm experiencing really interesting things. And we can say like, what? And I'd be like, the breath. And that's, well, that's something really quite different. Huh? And that's a, a deeper understanding, you know, is going to lead us even further. So the, I mean, there, there's a steps nine through 12. There's an even deeper level of the mind, which is not a sankara at all, is just the chitta itself. Um, so the, the final you know, step in this tetrad is to tranquilize the chitta sankara. You understand it. And um, the way this will be for most meditators is they start to realize they don't have to do anything about pitti and sukha. Like normally, and if you haven't experienced this, you will. When we have the experience of pitti and sukha, we try to make it bigger. And so we strain and we wiggle and we, we try to find it in the body. We try to figure out where it's coming from. Um, basically we fall off our meditation object by focusing on the pitti and sukha because they're so attractive. That's what we want, right? Pleasure. But as we start to develop an understanding that it is our, um, is our responses to, to, to happiness, which are actually getting in the way of just experiencing it. And we start to relax and we realize every time we have an experience of pitti and sukha, we don't have to do anything at all. We stay with our meditation object, which in this case is the breath. And when we have an experience of pitti and sukha, we stay with the breath. 
Because the reason the Pitti and Sukha are arising is because we stayed with the breath until we released all of our suffering in the, in the physical, sensual sense of it. Uh, and so if we stay with this experience of the breath, even when we're experiencing really strong pleasure, really strong happiness, really strong delight and exuberance, then we're gonna get to a point where we can even drop all of our associations around delight and bliss and exuberance. And once we've done that, we have just the bare experience of delight and exuberance. And this is, this is a very you know, powerful condition. So um, the reason most people are trying to, um, to use Pitti and Sukha as a springboard into jhana is because it's possible. And the thing is, before the experience of Pitti and Sukha, we have to use meditation techniques. We have to try to develop our mind and count and scan through the body and, and all of these things because we don't know what we're going for. But the moment we experience Pitti and Sukha, we can say, okay, now you just stay with those experiences and don't do anything and they will grow because you'll be, you'll be kind of shedding all of your baggage as you stay with these. Um, but the way that the, the Buddha encourages us to, to do this is a sequential process. If we stay with the experience of the Chitta Sankara and we, and we begin to investigate, like, how do I react to happiness? How do I react to pleasure? Um, do I do something that scatters it to the wind? Do I ignore it? Do I get it and then try to get something else? Or can I just be happy? You know, and this is this is true contentment, true wealth. It's something to truly seek and be satisfied with. Well, then uh, we're going to develop in a linear manner. Our samadhi is going to be um, is not and not only our samadhi is going to be strong. Not only is our our meditation, our concentration going to be strong, but we will develop the insight that the Buddha was pointing at the insight to an unshakable peace. Yeah, unshakable peace is not there at step 16. It's not at step 12 or step eight or step four. The unshakable peace is there the whole way along. So I encourage you to, to investigate these thoughts. You know, anytime that you're going along and you have an experience, maybe, uh, maybe your mind is very calm, very centered. Maybe you catch a whiff of a, of a flower or something, and it's a very strong experience. You realize because you're not distracted, because you're really paying attention, and you notice just a hint of pleasure with that. You can, you can ask yourself, like, oh, is that, is that this thing? And then see how you relate to it. You know, this is something that can be investigated right in the here and now. Every experience you have of relief of satisfaction, of completeness, of contentment, uh, can be a little hint of what it is that's being alluded to. And as you get better at understanding this, you will find that it's, it's a very interesting field of study. You know, what it's like to be able to receive happiness without greed, without hatred and delusion, uh, to experience happiness and not make anything out of it is to be free of suffering. And that's what the Buddha is pointing to. Okay, so these are, these are some thoughts and it's meant as, a, um, as a, an encouragement for contemplation and, and sort of as the opening um, talk to um, uh, a retreat or a weekend of practice. Um, or a week of practice or a month of practice. This is a very deep and rich field of study. Um, so I encourage you to, uh, if anything here made sense, to take it with you and really investigate it in your own practice. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.